All right, guys, I'm going to get us started. A warm welcome to everybody to our next Leaders in Public Health uh, event. Uh, we've been highly anticipating Commissioner Vassan's visit to Yale. I know for weeks he's already had a busy day with us, uh, meeting with our Environmental Health Studies Department, many of our students participating in a roundtable with Commissioner Jithani. Um, and now we are absolutely thrilled to welcome him to our larger um, Yale School of Public Health and Yale community. As you all know, the Leaders in Public Health series um, is really focused on bringing extraordinary public health leaders, thinkers, and doers to our campus in order to advance our four pillars of the school, inclusion and community, innovation and entrepreneurship, communication, and most of all, data-driven leadership. And I believe that Dr. Vassan embodies all four of those characteristics. I'm gonna give a real brief intro of him and embarrass him a little bit, and then we'll launch into a fireside chat between him and me. We'll have that last for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions, um, both from those in the room and from those on Zoom. And so I do wanna give a warm welcome to those who are joining us remotely today. So a little bit of bio about Ashwin. Um, his career, as many of you may know, began in global health, uh, where he worked with Partners of Health and the Department of HIV AIDS at the World Health Organization. He's written quite powerfully about that experience and his impact on the way that he perceives the um, value of public health and the intersection between public health and health care. In 2016, he was the founding executive director of the Health Access Equity Unit, a citywide initiative within the New York City Department of Health aimed at improving the health and social welfare of marginalized communities within New York City. Since then, he's done a variety of other things, but for, most importantly for the last two years, has served as New York City's health commissioner, where I would say that he has been, at least from my eyes, one of the more transformative commissioners um, of certainly this century. We've got 24 years of that, um, but perhaps even longer than that. He's implemented changes to the public health system to address multiple contributors to and upstream causes of declining life expectancy, including overdoses, chronic disease, birth inequities, climate change, gun violence. He created a citywide mental health agency, the nation's first telehealth and Paxlovid prescription home delivery program, the nation's first MPOX vaccination clinics, and an abortion access hub, which connects people across the United States to re reproductive health care. In addition to being commissioner, he's a practicing primary care physician um, and has joint appointments at Columbia's Medical School, which is my alma mater, and at the Mailman School of Health, um, continues to publish extensively and uh, to communicate, most importantly, to the public. So, Commissioner Vassan, thank you for being here. I'm looking thank forward you. to chatting and, and learning about your vision for the future of public health. He and I had a conversation on his grounds uh, about a month or so ago in New York City um, and so now it's it's fun to bring you here and to get to have the flip side of the conversation around the practice um, of public health and how it intersects with academia. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Um, we loved having you down in New York City, your your work on gun violence prevention specifically, but your broader uh, focus on the bridge between academia and public health practice, I think is exactly what's needed for academic public health leadership for this time. You guys are really lucky to have a great dean um, and so I'm very lucky to be here. I'm sorry that I never graduated from Yale. Um, <laughs> I did get one of my degrees um, a little further up 95, but um, okay. it is great to be here. I do remember interviewing here for medical school. Um, so it's nice to be back and I will sample your pizza. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> The, the public, the health commissioner likes pizza. It's all good. We're, we will challenge you as to whether New York City pizza or New Haven pizza oh. is better at some point. I won't put you on the spot in front of everybody, but yes, <laughs> it'd be a good way to get you in trouble with your mayor. That's correct. Um, so, so to kick things off, one of the things that I have thought kind of was most impressive and uh, innovative about uh, your work is something that you launched relatively recently, the, the launch of Healthy New York City. Um, and I'd love for you to share a little bit with the audience, both about what motivated you to develop Healthy NYC, which for those who don't know, is a campaign to improve life expectancy in New York that includes a codification of this campaign, not just into the Department of Health structure, but actually into law. It makes it something that's going to last long past your tenure 
um, and past the mayor's potentially as well. May he continue as long as he wants in his role, um, but would love to think to hear about kind of what motivated you and then how you got it in place. It's a great question, and um, thank you for asking it because it means a lot to me. I the my general take on leadership of any kind is to to try to adopt the scouts motto. How many of you are scouts or were scouts? Any scouts in the room? Girl, boy. Yeah, whatever. it doesn't matter. I, yeah. I just say scouts. Um, leave things better off than you found it, right? We all in service, whether you're in public service and academic service, you just have to try to move the ball down the field, right? You have to try to leave things better off than you found it. And I feel like that's my obligation. And one of the ways in which I think about that is what I can put into place that can't just be immediately undone by it, someone coming in with a different point of view. But that's not the real reason we did this. Um, you mentioned how I started my career on global HIV, but it's a, at a very specific time in global HIV when we were fighting in the early part of this century <clears throat> to get life-saving treatment out to the places it was needed the most in the global south. And there was a time when there was a discourse that was centered around, and, and in fairness, Schools of Public Health were, were leading some of that discourse of treatment's not cost effective. It's too, it's not sustainable. Oh gosh, we have a scarce amount of resources. How do we apportion that in terms of treatment and prevention? A scarcity mindset, which kind of can infect all of us, right? Um, I was lucky enough to have mentors, uh, Paul Farmer, who we lost uh, two years ago now, um, and Jim Kim who forced us all in many ways to break beyond that scarcity mindset and to say, what happens if we set an ambitious goal that we all have to align around and strive towards, regardless of whether we achieve it, that will come with obligation, activity, responsibility, and, and motivation. And, and so we launched the three by five initiative, which was to try to get 3 million people on treatment from a starting point of around 400,000 in the Global South, to get 3 million people in the Global South on treatment by the end of 2005, which, which uh, represented about 50% of the need. So for many, we were laughed out of the room. We were thought unrealistic. Again, schools of public health were a part of that discourse. Um, I'm so glad that that's, that's shifting. Um, but we missed the goal. We missed the goal by a million people. At the end of 2005, we only had 2 million people on treatment. We had gone from 400, and 400 440,000 people to, to uh, 2 million. And I said to Jim, Kim, who went on to lead the World Bank and to be the president of Dartmouth, um, I said to him, this is bad. We missed the target. What does that mean? And he said, this is great. <laughs> I looked at him askance as a student. I was in your shoes. I was just starting my career. I just finished public health school. I hadn't even gone to medical school yet. And um, he said, this is great, Ashwin, because the trains left the station. And you're either on it or you're not on it. But 20 years on from that, we're having a rational discussion about ending the HIV epidemic in our lifetime. If you had told me that 20 years ago, I would have thought you mad. And that's the kind of power of visionary, ambitious, goal-oriented thinking that I've tried to bring to Healthy NYC. So during COVID, regardless of what you, the postmortem on the COVID response, one thing is clear, we all aligned around it in some fashion, right? It was the singular public health topic of our time of the last few years. And so I watched the public sector, the private sector, I watched nonprofits, philanthropic, all these pillars of our civic infrastructure in cities and states and localities around the country, around the world, get behind responding to COVID in an emergency. And I said to myself, as I took over at the beginning of 2022, Omicron was, Omicron was um, afoot, but it was a sense for those of us who, who have some training in virology and, and uh, epidemiology, we had a sense that this was such a big shift in the virus that it would eventually um, continue to peter out rather than 
have successive waves like Omicron. And, and I said, what's going to be the next public health challenge that we focus on? What can we galvanize around that's bigger than the sum of our parts? And what can we galvanize around that can bring all of us together around a common health agenda? So we started to unpack our vital registry data across the year, across 2022, and the, the data was really stark. New York City alone lost five and a half years of life expectancy. Black New Yorkers, 6.8 years. Latino New Yorkers, uh, 5.8 years, or six point almost six years. And the stark inequities, the overall loss of life expectancy for the first time in a century. But when you really unpack the data and peel it back, you see a flatlining in life expectancy for the decade prior. Case and Deaton have written about this, right? Deaths of despair is one driver of this. But what it said to me is that's a project. Mm -hmm. There's a collective project here. And frankly, what does it say about us as a democracy, as a society, as an American project, when despite unprecedented amounts of spending on health care and in health and unprecedented attention on public health, that on our watch, life expectancy is falling? What does it mean for the collective sum of our work? What's the big why? Why are we doing this if people aren't able to live healthier, longer lives? And so we organized our city around this ambitious goal of getting to the highest life expectancy ever, uh, 83 years, by the year 2030, and doing so by addressing the leading causes of death, premature death, excess death, death and racial inequity um, you, through quantitative goals. Screenable cancers, cardiometabolic diseases, overdoses, suicides, violence, um, black maternal mortality measurable goals, quantitative goals that then begets the question of how do we achieve those goals mm -hmm. and what's the attributable impact of different strategies and who owns those strategies, which sectors, which agencies, which parts of non-city civic infrastructure are going to move behind this. And that's what Healthy NYC does. And you mentioned lastly, the local law that we passed that just got passed into law last week. I knew that that was a big project. And 2030 is long. It, I don't know how long I'll be in this job, but I don't know that I'll be in it in 2030, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. And that, that would be a tremendous thing. It would be a tremendous thing. And just, to, Paul, yeah. <laughs> just to end, I mean, and the mayor will be at the end of his tenure. And uh, if he has two terms, you know, this has to be long work. This has to be our collective project. This has to be something that lives long beyond the political cycles and the vagaries of elections. This has to be something that is a summary measure of the quality of our democracy and the quality of our civil society. And I think public health has a role to play in organizing that conversation through data, through strategy, through convening, and through leadership. And so that's, that's what we wanted to do with Healthy NYC, and we're just getting started. So, it's One of the things that I thought was really tremendous about it was that in launching it, that you started to reshape the public conversation about kind of this intersection between public health and health care. As we've come out of COVID, so many of us have experienced, right, that folks' conception of what public health is has been limited to just COVID and maybe even to some very specific aspects of the response to COVID. One of the things that I thought was so brilliant about Healthy NYC was that kind of expanding of the aperture of what is um, in our remit. And bringing others together to the table. And I, I wondered if you talk a little bit kind of about that communication side and, and that kind of mobilization of larger society and, and of yeah. New York in general. Well, let me let you in on a secret of Healthy NYC. It's actually a prevention agenda. <laughs> I just didn't call it a prevention agenda because we've tried that before yeah. and people it doesn't resonate with people. People don't really understand what a prevention agenda is. But when you look under the hood on how we reach each of these mortality targets, by 2030, we're definitely not going to treat our way out of it. The health healthcare systems, and I'm a practicing clinician today, um, will play a big role, but not the outsized role that it currently plays in American health and uh, American society, frankly, right? We're on pace. A quarter of our G mm -hmm. currently 17% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. It's projected to reach a quarter by 2030. It's projected to reach a half, close to a half by 2050 if we proceed at pace. 
So that's just not sustainable for our country. And it's not leading to the outcomes we want. You all know that intuitively. That's why you're here, training in public health. So I knew that intuitively too. And, and I knew that also as a clinician, a primary care clinician who has felt all too often that I don't have the tools in my arsenal in my clinic mm -hmm. to treat what really ails my patients, which is social needs, inequity, racism, policy failure, um, lack of investment in communities, so on and so forth. So um, I think it's a chance for us to, rather than compete public health versus healthcare, mm -hmm. how do we create a holistic bridge? And I want to be clear to those of you who maybe sit more on the healthcare side, it's not just about unlocking healthcare dollars and trying to drive it into non-healthcare spending. That, that, that's an important area of work. We're working on a large Medicaid waiver, for instance, in New York State and in the city. So that's not trivial because there is such a disproportionate spend on healthcare, right? Only 3% of our, 3 cents on every dollar, 3% of our overall health spend goes on prevention and public health. But we will have to find also new ways of investing in the fundament and the social and structural determinants of health. Uh, we will have to strengthen government public health in order to do so. We will have to invest in resilience and emergency preparedness in order to do so. So I think there's a real chance, if not to reorient the conversation, to broaden the aperture mm -hmm. and not create false choices between prevention and care, but rather say it exists as a spectrum of things that we need to do to improve population health. Another thing that you and I have had some discussions about and at the round table that we're just coming from, we talked about a little, is this process of translating science into practice. And as you are embarking on Healthy NYC, you know, as you list out kind of the core areas that you're working on, we have a lot of science around what works best. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also space for us to create new knowledge and data. And so I'm interested in hearing kind of in an ideal world, um, how you would see yourself working with academic public health to help advance your goals. Well, first thing is to say, we need you, right? We, we definitely need you. Um, we need to be in closer dialogue with you so that you know what's top of mind for us and what, we, what the pain points are for us in terms of making the decision that we need to make to resource the right strategies to reach our goals. We need, you, we, need, we need you to understand that it isn't just about the politics of it, that there is a space for a true evidence-based policy discourse that compares interventions, that compares strategies, but we need you guys to help us provide that data. And, and so I wanna be in much closer dialogue with you um, around how to ask and answer questions that are gonna be most policy relevant to, to decision makers, resource allocators, and policymakers in the public health um, and public health adjacent realms. So that's one. Two is workforce. You're the future. You're the future of our agencies. You're the future of government public health. You're the future of nonprofit public health. You're the future of certainly academic public health too. We need you to be prepared to work in government, but we need you to be prepared to work with government also. And, and we've talked a little bit about that sort of future of public okay. health training to make sure that you emerge with all of the scientific toolkit that you need, but with a social toolkit and a practical toolkit to apply that science. Because at the end of the day, public health is truly an applied interdisciplinary science. In its best form, it is the intersection of science and society. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, we have over-indexed on science and haven't really thought about the role of our work in society. And you saw that play out during COVID in terms of the way we talked about the data, the way we communicated, the way we made decisions on the basis of data. It worked sometimes and it didn't always work. Now, a simple answer is, well, it just got politicized. It's not that simple. It's also that we have to start really taking into account the social impact of our data and the questions we ask, how we ask those questions, how we apply the scientific method to answering population health questions is really essential. And I know that you're focused on ensuring that every student that comes out of this place 
and every faculty that thrives in this place is weighting those two things really, really um, in in the right measure. Mm -hmm. And and I think I, it is just reminding ourselves, and, and I'll put my history of science hat on here, right? That any science that is done is done in the society and the culture in which we live, ranging from the types of data that we're able to collect to the ways that we analyze and interpret it, to of course, the way that we put it out into the world. And we can and should have those struggles and tussles about what the best way to apply science is. There's often not a clear right answer. There's an answer that prioritizes one public good versus an, an answer that prioritizes another public good in different sectors of society may hold those various areas of prioritization somewhat differently. My hope is, is that we can provide the best possible evidence about what will advance health and to do so in a way that allows other sectors to also thrive. And if I may, yeah. underneath Healthy NYC, one of the parts that's not really talked about, but we're, we're partnering with um, some institutions in New York around economic and population health modeling mm -hmm. to answer the exact questions you're talking about. What is the comparative analysis of one intervention versus another or a portfolio of interventions to try to get to a population health goal like a mortality reduction from screenable cancers by 10% or uh, closing of the birth equity gap by X percent, right? These are we don't often engage in that analysis because we don't we think of either singular interventions that we want to test through rigorous scientific method or or we think about the larger comparative decisions as inherently political mm -hmm. but i think we can apply scientific rigor if not to it, it's not clear that that's going to lead to the decision we want but right now there isn't a discipline in policy circles to even make those trade-offs. The Congressional Budget Office doesn't do this, not really. Um, and it's certainly not done at states and, and local levels. There are some singular examples. Washington State does a really great modeling exercise with the Nurse Family Partnership. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just one intervention. And it's compared to other kind of childhood interventions. But So we can do more to apply uh, modeling and forecasting in the scientific method to um, these questions of trade-offs. Well, and to the evaluation after you put something in place. I think you know, I will frequently say that one of the things that has driven me into academic leadership is the fact that my NIH grants, the vast majority of them have never actually led to practice change, right? I'm very proud of the science that I've done, of my methodological and kind of intervention development, but those are not actually the things that I've done in the world that have led to real world change. And so that that gap between the science that's being done in academia and then the real world, you know, we, we say that we're doing kind of hybrid efficacy effectiveness studies. We say that we're doing implementation science, which of course we have many of the world's experts at here at Yale. And yet, and yet when that grant ends, the program disappears. And so thinking about how do we create those glide paths for implementation for cities, for the private sector, for philanthropy, and then how do we evaluate on the other side whether or not it made a difference to me is, is just key, right? So so often once it goes off into city, state, uh, territorial health government kind of implementation, we stop with that evaluation. And, and you've been relentless in terms of the emphasis on that need for evaluation and the need for data that represents all of your constituents, right? Making sure that you're yeah. getting better data, more equitable data and looking at it. I wondered if you could share a little bit, you, you have the Center for Population Health Data Science. Yeah. Can you yeah. share a little about that with folks? Um, we are awash in data and yet we aren't really pulling out insights from that data in part because we lack, I think something really key in population health and public health um, planning, which is informatics which is the layer between analytics and infrastructure. So we've got a lot of siloed data sets in and around New York City, and each of those are being worked on to tell a story about population health. But really what their the population health as they conceive it is a, is a substitute. It's the cohort of people that they can see. So it's the people who go to my hospital versus your hospital or who live in this zip code versus that zip code. Um, but what I'm trying to do, and COVID really pushed us forward, but we built with a lot of extra person time and scotch tape and string, is <laughs> a single point of truth around health in our city. 20 years ago, my predecessor, one of my predecessors, Tom Frieden, who went on to become the CDC director, 
created the Community Health Survey in New York City. And at that time, that was pathbreaking because it was the single descriptive point of truth mm -hmm. for population health in New York City. 20 years on, that's no longer used that way. 20 years on, no one is going to make policy decisions based on the rate of self-reported diabetes. As a doctor ever told you, you have condition X, which 20 years ago it was. We were doing actual great, great work at the district and zip code and community level. Elected officials were using those community health profiles that we produced on the basis of the community health survey um, to, to take action. But 20 years on, when we have Medicaid claims data, we have EHR data, we've got social services data, we've got health information exchange data that is, uh, let alone enhanced surveillance capabilities and more surveys than ever, we've got to find a way to create a data hub. And that's why we created the Center for Population Health Data Science. It is, how do we leverage informatics? And when I say informatics, it's things like modeling and forecasting, the use of AI, um, data visualization, um, and the layer of capacity and analytics to bring together, match, analyze, clean, analyze, and then develop citywide insight mm -hmm. from um, a unified data hub, a data lake, for those of you who kind of live in that world. The last thing I'll say is public health in the United States is largely at least government public health is largely based, and the data we have is largely based on a mandatory reporting framework. So in New York City, there are 72 conditions, mostly infectious, that I get obligatory data for, per federal, state, and local rules. The, what about everything else? What about mental health and overdoses and diabetes and hypertension and what's killing New Yorkers based on the population health data. It's not infectious diseases anymore, right? So while that may be very useful for emergency response and for another um, pandemic, I need to know how to do population health planning for the things that are killing New Yorkers today. And I don't currently have the ability to do that. But I think the future of public health leadership is one where we develop those informatics and data, unified data capabilities at an area level right? For the entire city of New York, eight and a half million people at a geographical level. And good news is that people are starting to catch on. Mm -hmm. the, you, you're aware of ARPA-H, the, the recent 2022 um, corollary to DARPA, the Defense Agency for Research, something, something. Um, <laughs> they're, they're doing a call now for area-based population health planning and, and the infrastructure behind that. And we're, we're working closely with them to see if we're a good fit. And so I think we're moving in this direction. Which I think is a neat thought too for us, you know, the folks in the audience, you come from across the U.S. and also from across the globe. You know, New York City has traditionally been a flagship of public health innovation. Um, and so as Commissioner Vassan is developing these strategies, I think it's a quite interesting question for each of you to think about how do we extend these beyond greater New York City? How do we bring the data kind of accuracy and at attention to um, gathering and analyzing disparate sources of data? How do we bring the commitment to talking about improving lifespan and maybe also health span. How do we kind of take, how do we codify that actually into legislation to make sure that it can't be cut or ignored um, when the next commissioner or executive branch uh, office holder comes in? And so it, I would love your thoughts on kind of how our students could take these ideas and, and expand them again, both across the country, but also potentially across the globe. Yeah. And I, I feel so blessed. I think this is the best public health job in the country. <laughs> Why? Because it, we spend more per capita on public health in New York City than any place in the, in the country, and uh, more than a lot of places in the world. We attract talent from all over the country. We hope that many of you will come and work with us. Um, either and you in, have internships, right? We have, Somewhere, intern yeah. we have the <laughs> largest, oldest public health, government public health research internship um, the HRTP program, health research training program, um, in the nation. And there's a track record, uh, a history of the work we've done in New York city, whether it's around TB, HIV, polio, tuberculosis, uh, I said TB, uh, tobacco, uh, a, um, 
STIs, name it, and COVID, setting a setting an example for the country and the world. Um, you know, our tobacco policy, it was, and the Smoke Free Air Act that we that Tom Frieden led, is the basis of the Global Framework Treaty for Tobacco Control. Mm -hmm. So. The potential is great for a place like New York, which is truly sui generis in some ways. We are local, we are parastatal, we are national. We are also unencumbered by some of the, mm -hmm. the restrictions that state authorities have or that federal authorities have. So we have these flexibilities and freedoms and we have both the ability to attract incredible talent and we also have the ability to elevate this through communication because we're in the media capital of the world. So it's a blessing to be in this job. It's a challenging job, but we need you to be the future of this work. We need Yale public health students to want to come to a big city like New York and practice public health, to want to bring your academic training into the real world and to push us forward and to help us innovate. You know, one of the questions I, one of the comments and questions I hear consistently from young people is how do we take the rhetorical focus on equity? Mm -hmm and really drive it into practice. Like how do we put our money where our mouth is? And, and I can tell you that it's one of the hardest things to do because rhetorically we talk a lot about equity and racial justice and, and, and but I grew up under mentors who put that into practice. They went to the hardest places in the world, Haiti, Rwanda, Lesotho, um, Tom's prison in Siberia, Peru, and did the hardest things, the most complex care and proved it could be done. So I try to take that inspiration and say, well, are we actually putting our dollars out the door into the communities that need it the most that will actually ladder up to our healthy NYC goals and population health change? Because there isn't a path to achieving our life expectancy goals and the sub drivers of those goals that doesn't center equity. But I think it's gonna be your generation that comes into government and mm -hmm. comes into the public sector and comes into the nonprofit sector and actually Figure, helps us figure out how to do that. Because right now, we are these large, often clumsy bureaucracies that struggle to get the dollars both out the door fast enough, but also into the communities and into the organizations that can that might be long on trust and capability, but short on capacity. Um, so that's a real challenge to you. I, I need your help. You know, We need your help in New York to do that better. Well, and there I would say kind of for many of our students, it may be working in public service. It may also be working in those community-based organizations and creating those liaisons back to city, state, county, or federal, or even international um, departments of health, recognizing them as partners and using your knowledge, uh, your experience, your expertise to help advance the work that, that you all are doing. So you talked a little bit about, about trust, and that's actually going to be my last question before I, before I open it up to the group. We've had conversations offline about how we grow trust um, in public health, um, how we think about um, growing the trust of those community-based organizations who do have the boots on the ground and are the ones doing the work. Um, if you had to share something with our students as they're going off into their careers, um, you know, looking forward, when you and I started, the issue was HIV. That was our both of our kind of defining issue, which brought us into this field. For you all, my guess is it's COVID, or as we were just talking about climate change, or maybe it's social justice, racial equity. How would you see them kind of helping to build trust going forwards? And, and what do you see as the most important levers um, for this next generation? It's a great question and something I think about a lot. One, one, one um, ask of all of you from me and folks like us is don't fall victim to false choices. Mm. It's not either bottom up or top down, right? It's not either grassroots or grass tops. We need both. And what I mean by that is to unlock the power of our community organizations that are, as I said, are often long on trust, long on credibility, long on relationships that actually know how to work in and among the communities that have historically both are have the greatest need in the immediate, but also historically have been disinvested in, they need to be linked up into something bigger. And that means resources, training, technical capacity. Um, and often government is a partner, if not one of many partners to help do that. And we learned that lesson during COVID. About a year into the vaccination campaign, 
or maybe nine months into the vaccination campaign, we saw a, a massive black white vaccination gap in New York City. And a lot of that was oriented around our public housing system, which is predominantly black and Latino New Yorkers who live in our in our public housing system. And our incredible team led uh, Dr. Michelle Morse, who's our chief medical officer, led a led a program called uh, Public Health Corps. And Public Health Corps was about stationing community health workers in trusted organizations. Often these are organizations with five or 10 people that have been working in communities, bootstrapping their budgets, never receiving government dollars. And using the federal emergency dollars, we got them millions of dollars, over 100 community-based organizations. We, we put money into them to do uh, vaccine education, to do PPE distribution, mass distribution, testing, and to enroll people and get people to engage in care, despite the fact that they had trust issues and trust issues with institutions, trust issues with the messaging, rightfully earned over years and, and decades of, 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 of uh, maybe absence. So what we saw in the course of six to seven months was a closure of that gap. And it was all because, or a main reason was because we invested in the communities and in the people and in the organizations that reflect the communities and the people that people actually wanted to hear from. And that could actually convert a conversation into a vaccination. And so when we think about what you can do, don't feel like, I mean, I know you know this, but I hope you hear this, which is I'm talking about this from the population perspective, the government perspective, which was our goal was to get as many people vaccinated as possible, but we were leaving people behind. So whether you're working from the bottom up or the top down on that issue, just know that it's all connected in, a, in service of something bigger than the, the ability of any one institution to achieve on its own. And so I would just say, avoid those false choices, push past the reductive narratives about what's more important than another. And, and let's aspire to something bigger than any one of us can achieve. We have to have a collective drive and a collective mission to make this country, this city, our city, this country, the healthiest place it can be. And particularly living in the richest country in the world, the fact that we have the health outcomes do, that we do causes me no shortage of concern and consternation. And it should you, I know it does, that's why you're here. Um, but I hope that that is inspiring too, because I, there's a lot of work to be done and we need your voice, we need your perspective. And I, every day I encounter my young staff who are just out of school or who are coming in through internships and I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by you because you're just thinking about problems in totally new ways that um, I haven't thought about. And so we just need so many more of you to come, come work in public service. We need you, even if it's for a short amount of time, come do it. Thank you. I could ask a thousand more questions about overdose prevention and violence and emergency preparedness, but I promised that I would open it up to the room. So I want to invite folks in the room as well as on zoom, um, to raise your hand and, and ask your questions. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you oh, for being and here. Sorry, I forgot to announce at the beginning, I, I should have said, because I'm supposed to, according to our policy, this is being recorded. So our Yale policy, we're supposed to announce when lectures are being recorded. Okay. I forgot to do that. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, man, yeah. I'm on tape? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Change everything I said. Yeah. Okay. Great. So my question is, with many viruses contributing to decades-long consequences that manifest years and years later, like polio and HIV, I'm wondering, with COVID uh, appearing to do something similar, with long COVID affecting 15% of Americans who have been infected, and vaccination only, I mean, the numbers continuing still despite vaccination. So I'm wondering, with long COVID affecting so many people, one in 10, and then also contributing to the reactivation of dormant viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, I'm wondering what the city is doing or planning to do to uh, improve the indoor air quality and decrease viral transmission? It's a great question. Um, in our Healthy NYC goal, we have a goal to reduce COVID deaths by 60% by 2030. I hope that COVID is nowhere near the leading cause of death or in our leading causes of death by 2030. But we're only going to get there through, um, I think, interrupting transmission um, as much as 
continuing to push vaccination in the most vulnerable categories. Because when you look at who's getting hospitalized and who's sadly still perishing from COVID, it's people over 75, people over 65, people with underlying severe immunosuppression and chronic disease, and people who are unvaccinated or undervaccinated who haven't. So, so I think that that's one, one strategy. But to your point about long COVID, we're very proud of launching our long COVID cohort study in New York City. I want to be clear, I'm, I, there's so much about long COVID that I don't know. And I think we all need to approach, we're all scientists here and we're, uh, we, we're trained in the scientific method. We got to approach it with that humility. It is real. It's affecting a lot of Americans, but there's a lot we don't know. And when I think about the great cohort studies of our time, the physicians, nurses, health studies, Framingham, these are longitudinal cohorts that build understanding of disease over time that have actually shifted case definitions over time that have shifted treatment thresholds over time. So we need to do exactly the same thing for COVID. We need to come up with a case definition we can all agree upon that might shift over time, but that we then mobilize resources behind. And that's the important last thing I'll say. We've done this before. We did this with the World Trade Center registry in New York City. We had a point exposure of a, a horrific event with an environmental exposure that no one had ever seen before. And our health department created a longitudinal cohort that followed people who were immediately impacted, family members, people who are at ground zero, and continues to follow them to this day. But the basis of that research has informed disability policy legislation that has led to um, support for families, for, for victims, um, that has un changed our understanding of of environmental toxins and and even change building codes and use of materials in, in um, new construction um, and has actually influenced our understanding of other point source toxic exposures, things like burn pits in um, Afghanistan and Iraq. So goodness, we have so much to contribute here. And I think the long COVID cohort study is gonna do a great deal to advance this. As far as your question on ventilation, I think it's a really challenging one as it relates to things like building codes, right? We've got a complex building code uh, in New York City, and I know that there's interest in updating that building code to update um, HVAC systems and filtration systems. I think what we need to do through data is develop a, a constituency that would actually support that. that is, that's one of those great examples where public health can bring data and advocacy, but ultimately we're not in control of that outcome. We need the building code to change. We need our political leaders to, to get behind that. That needs to be implementable and enforceable in a city as old as New York with a building stock and a housing stock that is super old. Um, all really complex challenges, but not something we're inattentive to. Is a great example um, of it's, it's a great example of how um, uh, it's, on. It's, it's a great example of how kind of creating of those coalitions matters so much that we can have data we've known for a century about the importance of clean air and yet right when we do have those um, kind of either kind of old housing in fact it's impossible to change it all over immediately and so both continu continuing to contribute to the data continuing to create coalitions. Um, great, great, great change. We have other questions. Question here. I think his mic is not working. His mic not working. You want to go to Dr. Monin over on this side just so she's holding it more. technology. Hello. Okay. This is working. Hi. Um, I'm interested in kind of the data that might be invisible, such as family caregivers and unpaid caregivers of older adults and people with other chronic conditions, because usually it's not collected in the healthcare system, all the people who are actually affected by many yeah. health conditions. So I'm just wondering how what you see in terms of 
data collection moving forward and then just interventions in general that are more family oriented versus individual? Yeah, it's it, it, it's a great question. Um, it speaks just broadly to this issue of data matching and data access and governance of data because it those data aren't collected within any visible health or healthcare adjacent sort of data sets. They're collected in labor statistics and workforce statistics and employment statistics um, that we don't often have access to. Uh, we know that the care economy is the both the largest and the largest, the fastest growing um, sector in New York City. And it tends to be low income people, women of color and older women who are um, disproportionately um, serving in those roles, low paid, low wage jobs, and disproportionately um, uh, living with chronic illnesses, diet related diseases in particular, diet related cardiometabolic diseases. Um, so, we know those things. Um, a lot of that analysis hasn't necessarily been done provincially at the city level, but at the state level, because that's where a lot of the labor statistics are collected, although we have our own workforce initiatives. Um, one of the things we're working on is um, our family leave policies and um, healthcare subsidies for people working in the care economy. And what I mean by that is not just the time off to um, go seek healthcare, but the top up needed to access more than just the basic healthcare that's covered by the essential plans or the you know the the marketplace plans, which are often basic, very very basic. Um, and especially because we know that there's a disproportionate burden of cardiometabolic diseases. You're dealing with not just the basics of insulin and um, uh, lipid lowering drugs and antihypertensives. You're often dealing with the downstream manifestations of that, renal impairment, so on and so forth. So I don't have a great answer other than to say it's on our radar, but it requires more partnership between our labor and workforce offices and, and the health department. And the questions that come up there are like, what does the health department have to say about this that is unique? that isn't otherwise said through other means? And that's a real question. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think there was a question over here. Did you the microphone was not working. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Boston, for sharing your, your valuable work you're doing with us. Um, my question is from the mental health perspective, and I love the fact that you alluded to the mental health impacts earlier during your presentation this morning. So what is the public health response like post uh, heat-related events or climate change events? For example, we had a heat wave of June last year. So given the impact on the psychology of people, anxiety, depression, and even on the long line, find a long term, it could result in hopelessness. So what are we doing to help with behavioral adaptation to help these people actually, you know, get over it and then do do more, essentially? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and I shared some data. I gave a presentation earlier in environmental health around the fact that Actually, our mental health diagnoses, and we see this in terms of ER visits, hospitalizations, and self-reported data, we see that extreme weather, in particular extreme heat, but also air quality events and otherwise, exacerbate all of those things. So the idea that this is just a risk to our physical health is obviously not true. Um, there are real mental health impacts. We also see um, exacerbations of people who live with a priori chronic mental health conditions like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, and so forth. So just to just to validate that this is a, a major issue that we track, we actually track those healthcare interactions and self-reported um, mental health symptoms as it relates to extreme weather, which I think you're uh, talking broadly about is the manifestation of climate change that is most, most uh, present for us in a city and particularly a dense urban city like ours. It gets to the answer that I gave earlier, which is I think too often we're on our back foot in emergency response and we're not talking enough about what do we need to pre-position or pre-plan 
or invest in in peacetime so that we can activate during quote unquote wartime. Um, and that's where the community needs have to get lifted up. That has to take an equity focus. We can't, we have to invest in putting people, assets, commodities like PPE masks and, and other protective or, or medical countermeasures into the places where we know it's going to be hardest to reach or that have been historically disinvested in, where there's less clinical infrastructure, where there's less public infrastructure, where, you know, transportation deserts, places that have, um, that fall higher up on our heat vulnerability index, for instance, which is a composite score of green space and tree cover of um, racial demographics, which we know track very closely with inequity and, and outcomes, poor outcomes from heat, um, poverty. Um, so I think a lot of, we have to transition our mindset in emergency response, whether it's response to weather-related emergencies or infectious disease-related emergencies or otherwise, we need to transfer our mindset in health emergency response to what do we need to have in place to be activated rather than what do we need to bring in place at the moment there is an emergency. So that's one. Two is the day-to-day -day work. You know, one of the challenges of the public health core model that I mentioned is taking a program that was built off of federal emergency dollars and now transitioning it to ongoing uh, work. So not only changing the focus from COVID to broader issues and needs like mental health and chronic disease that are impacting the same communities that had the worst COVID outcomes in New York City, but figuring out a way to fund that sustainably so those are the kinds of ways in which we just need to get much better prepared in peacetime so that we can activate when there's an emergency. And, and I don't think we're there yet, especially at a time when CDC funding is getting cut, when budgets across cities and states are, are getting constrained, and where no one really wants to talk either about COVID or public health anymore, right? I mean, it's a tough position to be in because it's like a collective amnesia, and I do worry that we are going to be here again if we don't make some different decisions. At least in the city, we're trying to learn from our challenges. Well, Commissioner Vassan, thank you. This has been extraordinary. Unfortunately, we do have folks, as you see, kind of getting ready to leave for classes. You all know that in our Leaders in Public Health series, we do have little surprises under a certain number of seats. I've heard that some of you may be looking under your seats before you sit in order to find the one with a <laughs> swag, um, but I encourage you to look and, and there will be a few um, little bags uh, across the room. And, ah, the excitement. <laughs> And of course, we do have a swag bag for Commissioner of Asan as well, including a Yale School of Public Health tie. So next oh. time you come here, oh. you can wear. Okay, <laughs> I won't wear that in Boston, but I will. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you for joining us today.